The Fantastic Four have had a not so fantastic roller coaster of a ride of movies within the past decade. And as you can see from how long this video is, this is a pretty long video. You've read the title. In this video, we will be comparing strengths and weaknesses of the cheesy Fantastic Four from the early 2000s with Yuan Griffith, Jessica Alba, Chris Evans, and Michael Chiklis to the grim and gritty version of Marvel's first family, starring Miles Teller, Kate Mara, Michael B. Jordan, and Jamie Bell. As always, I'm gonna have to preface this by saying this is not a video arguing which film was a better movie, or which franchise I personally liked better. This is meant to determine which iteration of the characters would win in a fictional fight. So, arguing that one should lose points because of terrible CGI won't be accounted for because all these movies were terrible. I'm joking, but seriously, CGI, good or bad, won't be taken into account because all of this stuff is fake anyways. Again, I mean no intention to bash or discredit any of the actors in these films. This is purely meant for entertainment purposes. If you think this is a video for losers and no lifes, then hey, you read the title ahead of time and clicked on this video, welcome you no life loser. This is the first versus video where there are more than two combatants, with it being a team battle and all. So to measure each group's pros and cons, we will break it down into different character subsections. Mr. Fantastic, Invisible Woman, The Human Torch, The Thing, and Teamwork. So the first category is up. My god, this is gonna be a ridiculously long video. The genius but timid leader of the group, Reed Richards, is the first one on this list. He's not really that well known for his super strength. In fact, most of the shenanigans he does is a result of just using the momentum of his rubbery sheath-like lanky arms. But Miles Teller's version does trump Yoan Griffith's character by quite a bit. He easily overpowers trained military soldiers, instantly knocking them out with one punch. He uses his stretchiness to quote-unquote, exert a force of a large machinery. Whatever that means, Griffith's version hardly does any punching or kicking, typically resorting to unusually close quarters spooning or kinky spinning full Nelsons. I mean, there is the occasional tossing. Seriously, Griffith never really does anything in terms of physical pure brute strength. This one easily goes to Miles Teller. Speed is a pretty important thing when it comes to battles, but let's be honest, none of these guys can go that fast, but that's okay. Now this section here is a little more debatable as opposed to the strength section, because the 2005 Richards could literally turn into a doughboy while the other one could stretch out his legs as he ran, making his strides bigger and increasing his running speed. Yeah, you'd think the former is weird. Nah, the latter is much creepier. Yep, most definitely. So it's almost a toss up for me here, but in the end, I'd have to give it to Johan Griffith. Dude's basically a bicycle wheel. Running undoubtedly takes far more effort, so legit, Griffith could just assume the position and let gravity do all the work. Sure, Teller's jello-like limbs allow for bigger strides, but it's honestly counterproductive because it also stretches out the time from when he hits the ground. Here's what I mean. So a boot-like plastic man is right here, right? Well, scaling this dead dude's body, which is scarily contorted so similar to my sleeping position, he manages to jump like some 20 feet. The sad thing is though that it took him 1.65 seconds to do that. Meaning if he kept doing this derpy dolphin dive every time, he'd be running at 8 miles per hour. Which is almost half of what you and I can do. Plus, this wheel thing allows him to initiate some sort of flight. Not the good kind of flight though. You know, the kind of flight you get from a penguin. Or like, from a kite you buy from that one thrift shop. It also gives him the advantage to pervertedly violate his enemies, wrapping around them like a burrito. Yoan Griffith takes this one. This is the one section where Reed is supposed to be strongest at. Reed is intended to be the super smart kid that originally attended college at the age of 14. The time where he was probably going through that weird phase we all go through as teenagers. It starts with a P. Yep, that's right. Physics obsession. You may think that Griffith's version should easily win this, what with his older age, wisdom, and experience and all. I mean, yes, he did find out how to beat Doctor Doom and fiddled around with a tachyon pulse generator that separated the Silver Surfer away from his board, but Tellers did the first thing too and managed to crack interdimensional teleportation when he was just 10 years old. Comparing these two things is like comparing apples to oranges, but wait, hold on. Forgetting that he discovered teleportation for a second, you gotta admire the determination of this guy. I mean, when I was 10, I was just trying to get my hands on some Pokemon cards. Also, Fantastic Mr. Fox from the 2005 movie made a lot of screw-ups that could have led to fatalities. The whole reason why his squad got powers, or mistakes, as they suggest it to be, is because Reed found out that some cosmic energy clouds triggers evolution. He calculates when this cloud will pass by Earth, thinking that they could safely observe the thing, and we find out that that dude was dead wrong. The cloud came by their shuttle well ahead of schedule and they all got wrecked. And then again, he messes up on the magic machine that's supposed to fix their abnormalities. Granted, you could argue that the read from the 2015 film made mistakes too, but not so much to the extent of Griffith's character. The 2005 to 2007 flex stretch needed help for the tachyon device from start to finish. 2015's did get some outside help perfecting the teleporter, but he made it work by 12th grade just with Ben and him. 
which by the way, Ben doesn't really count as help to be honest. He didn't even have the model car during presentation. And the prototype alone is impressive, especially at an age where you're supposed to be figuring out how to play Pokemon. Did anyone know how to play that by the way? I know there's energy cards, are those supposed to be like life point boosters or something? This one goes to Teller. I'm gonna mix this section a little bit with durability, or in other words, how long one can take before succumbing to pain, or in this case, deflating like one of those wacky inflatable arm flailing tube bands. Both of these guys can withstand a lot because of their bubbliciousness, usually just absorbing the blows like a bouncy water mattress. Griffith and Teller both have taken hits from their best friends, but while the older one took the punch without a slight hint of pain, the new hipster reboot one got knocked out by touching eyebrows. He did get hit in the head as opposed to Griffith's man breasts, but his brain gets utterly juiced here by his fiance, and he doesn't seem harmed in any way after that. And Sue held him in that position for well over a few seconds. It's no contest, I'm giving this one to Griffin. The most disgusting superpower concludes Mr. Fantastic's entire subsection. The early 2000s version of the character has stretched around his boyfriend, The Thing, and has stretched all around the London's eye, while the most recent one experienced some hormonal imbalance because puberty and has a mental breakdown. Where are I mean, the Ferris wheel is 120 meters in diameter, but he only sourdoughs the wheel hub, which, scaled alongside the full wheel, is about 12 meters in diameter. More precisely, he bear hugs this smaller portion of the thing, which is two-thirds the diameter of the actual hub. Using the circumference formula, keeping in mind he rotated around it three times, it turns out that this rubbery man stretched well over 247 feet, nearly two and a half times the size of the new rebooted 2017 King Kong. That's not even taking into account his licorice hands wrapping around the support beams of the wheel, which would take his limits to reaching even beyond that of 2014's Godzilla, who is supposedly 355 feet tall. The older Griffith makes Teller's character look like a gumdrop button here. Here are the end results for this subsection. While Teller does excel in power and book smarts, Griffith seems to have a more resilient edge to him, which allows him to stretch to ludicrously high heights and perform absurd, yet convenient, abilities. The winner is Yoan Griffith. Usually by now it'd be over, but we're only a fifth of the way done. Back to square one. Susan Storm is the daughter of Franklin Storm and sister of Johnny Storm, aka the Flaming Cheesesteak. Now I know this first thing is titled Strength, but it's more so gonna be about how strong or powerful she is with her powers. And by that, I'm referring to her making force bubblegum shields. Jessica Elba and Kate Mara did show some impressive feats of their powers, but Alba's character was capable of leveling the 1,322-ton eye, making her powers more than meets the eye. <laughs> Though she didn't lift the entire weight, as the rock was the one that was underneath the whole thing, keeping the wheel from falling over was still a heavy job. Mara's Susan Storm still seems to be learning. Her powers as Susan Storm aren't really up to par with the older Susan Corn. Oh. The rebooted reboot suit can move two two and a half ton dry box containers a few feet, but keeping the 1,000 ton death disc from collapsing took much more effort. She did have help from Laffy Taffy, but she also managed to keep it up for more than half a minute alone. Jessica Alba deserves the point here. We're back at the section of speed, where we determine which person has faster velocity dyed hair or wig hair. Both incarnations of Casper barely showed any forms of running, but Kate Mara manages to keep up with her brother Johnny when she's escaping Planet Zero in her pod ball. Well, Johnny's fastest flight recorded was being able to cover 2,000 meters in 6 seconds, which is just under the speed of sound. Alba's, on the other hand, does neither the running nor the force field flotation shenanigan. Though she did unbuckle her seatbelt, gently hopped out of her car, ran in front of Mr. Silverware, spread her arms in English, got stabbed in French, cried in Spanish, and died by a spoon all before that silver stick reached the silver sunburn. If that wasn't super speed, I don't know what is. No, but in all seriousness, the 2015 Susan outclasses the one from a decade ago because... She just does. I mean, mock speed, what more could you want? You shouldn't be expecting something like Mach 42 or twice the speed of light or something, because what comes to mind when you think of the Invisible Woman? It's hinted at by the name itself of what you should expect. Invisible Woman. See, that's right. Bad movies. Kate Mara scores here. Intelligence is a key component in the Fantastic Four group with the most nerdiest of the group being Play-Doh and a window. This one was probably the easiest section to do in this entire video. Throughout the Tim Story series, let's be real, it wasn't a series, it was more of a two-parter episode, Miss Storm is more of an emotional, unstable girl who is implied to be super smart, but the movie doesn't do very well illustrating that idea. She often nags Reed, occasionally inspiring his work by accident or because of a slip-up in words. In the reboot, we actually see her in a much different light, 
While the other sought the attention of Reed and constantly bickered him about spending too much time with his work, this one was far more independent. She isn't exactly a computer nerd as much as Captain Oblivious, but she's really proficient in programming. She tracks Reed through a series of hacking internet cookies and Bowsers, something that the entire Area 57 trained nerd herd couldn't do. Oh, and look, she does that thing that Quicksilver does. Mara's storm is also the whole reason as to why the crew made it back alive in the first place. Well, sort of alive. <laughs> Nevertheless, she single-handedly brought three out of the four travelers back to Earth. I'm not calling the old Sue Storm dumb, it's just that she doesn't really do much for the team's technological and power advancements, aside from the occasional motherly instincts towards Cheese Puff and Pre-Captain America. Plus, she says if Johnny went hotter than 4000 Kelvin, then he'd be at the temperature of the sun. Which I'm not gonna call her out on, but that's not what Google says. There's a whole 1700 Kelvin he could play around with before reaching that temperature. I get that there are different regions that are hotter than others on the sun, like the interior and exterior, but just saying. Kate Mara earns another point. How much pain one can take physically and mentally is a huge factor in these kinds of things. Alba's and Mara's storms both show signs of weariness after significant use of their telekinesis, with the former having constant nosebleeds and the latter seemingly drowning in air. The writers behind the movies intend for these to serve as symbols of stress on both the mind and body, so enduring these for quite some time is pretty tough. In the end though, I'm probably giving it to Jessica Alba's album. Not because of the nosebleed, in reality she might want to get that checked out. Turns out nosebleeds are not supposed to be caused by stress or high blood pressure. She might be suffering from excessive nose picking or nose trauma. Or maybe she could be accidentally ODing on aspirin or cocaine. You know, the huge. I'm actually giving her the point because she was not in the slightest bit discouraged about being a superhero after legitimately dying in her fiancé's arms. I mean, she was literally stabbed through the heart and lost her life right before marriage. And then when Washboard Abs breathes life into her, she wakes up all hunky-dory like she just smelled roses on the 4th of freaking July. Like seriously, she did not give a shit that she just came back from the dead. Usually in other forms of media, like take Jason Todd for example from Under the Red Hood, coming back from the land of the dead isn't just like waking up, it messes with your mind. And that occurs in real life too. A man named Fabris Muamba suffered a heart attack and was claimed to be clinically dead. He had no vital signs. When he miraculously awoke, he said that it was as if he were in another body. Bottom line is, you don't just resurrect and say, ah damn, respawn took longer than I thought Lamau. let's do it again. So it's not really because of her physical endurance, because both characters I'd say are about equal there, but it's more about the endurance of the mind. If she can just wake up fine after dying as if just hitting the square button in Call of Duty, then she is one tough cookie. Elba gets the point for endurance. The more abilities you have up your sleeve, the better your chances are at coming out on top. I know this is titled telekinesis, but what I mean by that is how much one can do with their powers. The 2007 suit illustrated a wide and creative variety of uses of her force fields. From plain old bubble shields to window panes to artificial flooring, she can moonwalk anywhere. And like I said before, her telekinetic force is pretty powerful, but what Kate Marinara sauce lacks in strength, she has in abilities. She has such a wide variety of powers. Unlike Alba's iteration, this Susan Bourne can fly, lift others with her in her flying exercise ball no matter how heavy, and most importantly, she can make objects and people around her invisible. You could count this as flying, but for me, it's... it's really not. She never uses that trick in mid-air to simulate flight, so call it what you want, but for me, it's just moonwalking. Kate Mara takes the last section. The second results for the next scoreboard are in. This was a close one, but Kate Mara's wit and team effort really bring home the gold for her. Her intelligence, rather than sometimes serve as a nagging device, contributes to the team and half of the time saves the entire team from their demise that all four of their movies suffered. Additionally, her extra powers, those of which Alba's character lack, benefit the team. From escaping a planet to defeating Doom, the 2015 team couldn't have saved the day without her. They still couldn't save their own movie though. Alright, the second point goes to the reboot. Now time for the Marvel Cinematic Universe bandwagons. We're gonna veer towards the Susan Storm-ish route again, as neither Johnny Storms really show impressive or distinct differences in pure brute strength. This was indeed before the Super Soldier Serum and training with Rocky Balboa, so yeah, not so different. In that, we will be measuring who can reach a higher level of heat without turning into ashes. In the rebooted story, Johnny showcased a few bursts of fire. When he first got his powers, he raged a bit and blew out the windows within the room that was holding him, but the metal tray beneath him wasn't melting at all. Let's be generous and say that the metal here is composed of tungsten, the metal with the highest melting point. That would mean he couldn't go any farther than 3,695 Kelvin. 
In contrast, Chris Evans takes things up to 4,000 Kelvin as shown when his fellow teammates are studying his powers. It's confirmed Chris Evans is indeed Chris Evans. But there was this one year later segment in Fant Forstick where Johnny is displayed on screen at the Pentagon, training at Area 57. There's a list of stats that you couldn't really interpret because they could literally mean anything. The one thing that I could make out though, this is all under assumptions so take this with a grain of microsalt, is this thing labeled S Temp. No idea what the S stands for. Could be a 5 for all I know. But the temp probably stands for temperature, and the unit of measure is K which is Kelvin. If this is what it truly stands for, 5,301 Kelvin, then George Donovan beats Evans by 1,300 Kelvin, right? Wrong. In the earlier films, Johnny was said to be able to reach supernova, which is a temperature so high that it could end all life on Earth. This isn't the same supernova as the one we know in the real world because that'd probably destroy our sun too, not just Earth. Sue actually gives us a clear definition of what Johnny's supernova is like, explicitly defining it as the temperature of the sun, which is, as I showed earlier, 5,778 Kelvin. All things considered, even though we aren't explicitly told the temperatures of the newest human torch, using all the little clues from his training simulations and his time at Area 57, the human Cheeto is hotter by at least 400 Kelvin. Or if I was wrong about his meaningless stats, at most 2,000 Kelvin. Evans gets the first point. As opposed to the last two characters, Reed Richards and Susan Storm, Johnny could reach high speeds during mid-flight. In fact, both of these two guys, who ditched Fox to join the better superhero universe, illustrate this speed in their films. As stated earlier, the newer flaming CGI body was able to cover 2,000 meters in 6 seconds, around Mach 1. This trumps the Evans feat of barely flying faster than a missile, which has an average muzzle velocity of 300 meters per second. Almost the speed of sound as well, but it's ultimately still less than Jordan's flight record. I would have given the point to the guy in the movie that got the same score on Rotten Tomatoes as my US history exam a while back, but I haven't mentioned the reflective back of the iPod Touch yet. In Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, or Ross for short, the Silver Surfer unintentionally catches the attention of the team during Reed and Sue's wedding. Johnny flames on to pursue the Silver Swimmer but it ends tragically. Just kidding, not really. Thus, a chase scene follows, with the Human Torch tailgating the Silver Surfer. Well, earlier in the film, the Surfer traveled from one galaxy to the Milky Way in under a minute, about 44 seconds. We don't know what planet is being destroyed in the beginning of the film, but the closest galaxy to ours is the Andromeda Galaxy, which is about 2.5 million light years away, meaning he would have to be moving at a minimum of almost 2 trillion times the speed of light. Well, his surfboard moves at that speed. Really, he just sits there. He's pretty much a nothing without the board. Also, this could have been a planet from our galaxy. It could have been Pluto. And if it is, then he's a lot slower than that. Anyways, none of that really matters because it's implied that the surfer is a lot faster in space than he is on Earth. Like look here, if he were moving as fast as he did in space in this tunnel, everyone would be crushed from the wind pressure. Either that or a black hole is created and we all get sucked inside for a horrible dark death. Johnny manages to stay right behind him all the way from Manhattan to the Lincoln Tunnel in New Jersey to the Washington Monument in Washington DC. That's a 232 mile trip all in just 1 minute and 15 seconds, making this human dork move 14 and a half times the speed of sound. Speed also goes to Evans. As far as the movies go, both of these interpretations show Johnny to be this charismatic and hedonistic character, who enjoys messing with his team and getting into trouble. No doubt though, this is a landslide victory for Jordan. Evans' Johnny Bravo is extremely immature and doesn't really contribute to the team as a whole aside from keeping the jokes flowing. He literally almost kills everyone on Earth by trying to heat up past Supernova. And though Jordan gets a little in over his head sometimes, he is actually a really good mechanical engineer. So much so that he's been building cars by himself at a young age, and even being recruited by his father to improve the space shuttle teleporter in Fant 4 stick. The one from the early 2000s is like an overgrown manchild that shows very little analytical and team collaboration skills, while the other is the complete opposite. For sure, Jordan takes intellect. The endurance section is a little unfair because one of the combatants had two whole movies, whereas the newer one is probably only going to have one now that the actor ditched Fox. We see Johnny not so depth get into depth trouble when his car spins out of control and he crashes. I mean, that's a plus since he survived a car crash. I'm not saying that like it's nothing, but many people have survived car crashes. My cousin did and she wasn't even the one doing the driving. The blonde one survived a drop from a few hundred miles as the surfer guy brought him to the top of Earth's atmosphere and let him free fall. You'd think he would use his BBQ powers to lower the impact force, but no, he does the opposite. He boosts himself into the sand, and from that distance of a drop, water or sand is gonna feel like concrete. Sure, the underwhelming impact depicted on screen says otherwise, but I mean come on, this is coming from a film that both critics and fans crucified, what were you expecting? This would close the debate already, Evans gets the third point, but by OCD obligation I have to do a fifth category cause it just doesn't feel right. You know what I mean? It feels incomplete without it. Pyrokinesis is basically a fancier way of saying generating fire, or this is more based on the experience with fire and how well one knows how to use it. 
This is legitimately a toss-up as the one from Tim Story's franchise has had his powers for about two years, while the one in Trunks had it for just a year but received high-end spec ops training by the government. In one hand, you've got a dude that's had it for a longer period of time without any formal training, but on the other, you've got a guy who's had it for less time but with formal training. It's a fight between quantity over quality at this point. Granted, you could argue that Evans knows how to do that one neat cooking trick called Supernova, but we already used that argument for the strength category. Doing so would just be redundant and cheating. I'm joking, by the way. It doesn't really matter because Evans won this subsection already. I'm just gonna give this to Michael B. Jordan. Here's the meaningless scoreboard. Michael B. Jordan's take on the character was a far more serious and intelligent role than that of Chris Evans. He is shown to be able to collaborate with his teammates in a better fashion than his predecessor, and is pretty crafty with his hands. Despite all this, the older Human Torch's powers are superior. He can dial his powers up to the temperatures of the sun, and can take a hell of a lot of damage before he actually gets knocked out. As smart as he may be, the 2015 Johnny Storm is not as powerful as the 2005 one. So finally, the last member of the Fantastic Four is up. Benjamin Grimm, aka The Thing, is arguably the most popular member of the Fantastic Four. He is the muscle of the group, often being represented as the giant chicken nugget that can curl jeeps and other cars. Now looking at these two side by side, you could already guess who is stronger in terms of pure brute strength. But it's sad to say though, the result is pretty ironic. Though this fried wonton is much bigger than the guy from a decade ago, the things the thing does in those old films completely dwarf the accomplishments he did in the reboot. In the 2015 movie, the most impressive thing he ever did was tear apart a tank and throw it at some soldiers. The tank he completely wrecked was an M1A2 Abram, which weighs in at 62 metric tons. But he didn't lift the whole thing, he just ripped the head hatch off and used it like a frisbee. Using the average tensile strength of steel composed ceramic armor, assuming that the hinge bolts are just an inch thick, then ripping that thing clean off like that would take around 15 tons of force. My Chicklets, on the other hand, shoulder presses the 1322 ton London Eye. He had some help keeping it balanced thanks to Sue, but simply pushing it up was all him. He also utterly folded this car like an omelet, which is impossible. I mean, the guy's only 5'7", how in the hell did he get a grip on this thing? He already had one less finger on each hand, so how did he ever spread his arms so wide to shape it into a perfect snowball? Talk about a waste of time too. The whole reason why he did that was because he was pissed at Johnny for messing around too much. At what point in life do you ever just look at a car and go, wow, nice rims, sweet leather, awesome smell? You know what this needs? To be broken. I like how he doesn't just karate chop the center or throw it around till it breaks. He just silently shapes it into a ball and says, here you go. I'm surprised myself to say that Michael Chiklis wins the strength category. As opposed to the 2005 and 2007 one, Jamie Bell's Ben seems to have no trouble swinging his arms around and running as fast as cars. The Chiklis Ben Grimm seems to be moving as if he were wearing a big clunky suit. Which is pretty accurate because I mean he is wearing a big pudgy rubber suit. He may not be the fast puncher or runner, but he moves at a significantly faster pace than Cookie Monster over here. Jamie Bell gets the point on speed. Ben Grimm is well known as being the best friend of Reed Richards, serving also as his assistant when it comes to experiments and lab projects. The smaller Ben 10 is a very skilled pilot who claimed to be able to fly the space shuttle in the beginning of the first film and that product placement for toys. He's pretty much more independent than his new counterpart. Aside from standing by Reed during a science fair, Ben doesn't really do anything notable aside from punching and kicking a few military men. In fact, he doesn't really handle things all by himself all that well, often crying for Reed's help. It's not that he's dumb. I mean, if I were in that situation, I'd probably be screaming more than he did. I think it's mainly that the thing from the early days was more seasoned and experienced, meaning that he had more time to find his craft and creativity and think on his own. This guy was literally fresh out of high school. And let's be real, high school sucks. I can't hold you. So, the point goes to the man in the Halloween costume. Jamie Taco Bells and Michael Chicken Littles The Thing are both known to be virtually invulnerable, with their rock-like skin protecting from bullets and fire. In the cheesy slapstick version, The Thing has survived being hit by walls and withstood the powerful impact force of this semi-truck. Trucks like this usually weigh around 80,000 pounds. But since it didn't have any backload on it, something like that would weigh around 18,000 pounds. Assuming that he followed the rules of the road and didn't exceed the speed limit, which is probably not the case because I mean look at him. He had a whole 5 seconds to ease on the brake but he just like, hey yo is that a walking turd? This car was going more or less around 35 miles per hour. Though he took it like a champ, Bell's ability to fall from the heights of a B2 stealth bomber brings the bar way up in terms of endurance. It's funny though that this should have been the coolest scene in the film but they ended up cutting it out. It's not like the one scene could have saved the movie so what am I talking about? Still, this is the only hint suggesting as to how Ben was sent to missions. He literally just drops in every single time mid fight. We aren't told how high the bomber flies each time, but these things are capable of flying all the way up to 15,000 meters above the ground. So that means, every time he was deployed, including when he crash landed in front of Slinky, he could have fell from this height. With this high of a drop and his weight, 
Which, by the way, I thought you were like half a ton, but that's not even close. The force upon impact would be like getting hit by a semi-truck at supersonic speeds. I don't expect you to know what that feels like. I mean, if you did, you'd be dead. But let's be honest, you're probably already dead inside after watching this cringy video. And remember, he does that every single mission he's assigned to. And he just gets up like he just walked out of the refreshing shower booty ball naked. He presumably also takes gunfire without hesitating. It cut out this scene again, but he's been on multiple military operations dealing with machine guns and explosives. While Chickless's had a bird take a dump on him and he got pretty pissed. Not to discredit, Chickless's character does get shot too, but the rocks on him chip off. Meaning, if enough bullets are shot towards him, he could be reduced to the size of a pebble. Yeah, Bells gets endurance. The name of this section already gives the winner away. I know I said earlier that Chickless's Ben was able to carry and lift more weight than Bells, but you don't really see him cause some serious mayhem when he punches people. You barely see him punch anything at all to be honest. There was that one time where he did angrily punch Johnny through Mr. Fantastic, making him fly like some 15 or 20 feet back. But damn, this guy flew across the Indian Ocean. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Michael Chiklis is the thing is indeed physically stronger, but Jamie Bell's punches pack more of a wallop. A much, much bigger wallop. The older Ben was about the same size as the actor, 5'7", whereas the newer one is 6'8". About the same as LeBron Ajane's. Jamie Bell's version takes the cake. You don't really need to see this, but I have to show you so that I can get that mad YouTube revenue that this website does not give me. In summary, Ben Grimm from the 2005 to 2007 series was a smaller, yet experienced and stronger take on The Thing. He knows how to get around by himself, but The Thing from the reboot is much more durable, moves faster, and punches with much more power. Despite his dependence on others, he isn't really stupid, and he can get by on his own as he too, alongside Johnny and Sue, has had elite training from the government. This was a close one, but the 2015 The Thing wins. So now that all of the character subsections are done, here's a quick message from my sponsors. <laughs> Teamwork is essentially the skill of group members being able to effectively communicate with one another to achieve a common goal. It's not those BS team-ups where your professor groups you up with three of the laziest students in the entire uni. No, 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 no. This is about collaboration. That being said, both of these teams aren't too good here. I mean, both of their films revolve around the same premise when it comes to the third act. Confront doom, attack individually, fail, do it again, fail, team up filled with loud exposition, win, bomb at the box office. You can't really use the argument of how fast each respective team took to take down doom, cause number one, that's just weird, and number two, they both did it barely under a minute and 30. Like it's scary how close their times were. When it comes down to it, teamwork is only bettered with experience, which is built on screw ups. We've been told this ever since we learned to speak. We make mistakes and live with regrets so that we don't repeat those same hiccups again. As time goes on, we push ourselves to be the better us. And with all that being said, I will have to say that the Fantastic Four with the pre-pubescent Captain America has much better teamwork than the newer one. Rise of the Silver Surfer takes place two years after the first movie, so that means that the team had had two years of getting to know their powers and what helps their team. They've mastered the use of Johnny's supernova without hurting others, and they even ended up trusting him with the combination of powers at the end of the second film. Sure, they still had team arguments in the sequel after that so-called experience, most of the time thanks to Johnny 2x4, but the team grew to know each other's personalities and powers. Johnny matured a bit, barely though. Sue became more considerate about Reed's warning signals. Reed found the true importance of the team, and Ben... is still Ben. But that's not the point. The 2015 Fantastic Four team barely even know each other. You may say that they've received grade A military practice for a whole year, but during those 365 days, They've been isolated from one another. Ben's been out doing his own spy stuff. Sue is held indoors trying to master her dropping a deuce face. Johnny's been in and out of the lab for isolated target practice. And Reed dipped on his team and did not receive any training at all. Really, the time they're together on Planet Zero at the end of the movie is the only time they are witnessing each other's powers in person. That explains the lack of communication behind attacking Doom at first. And that's the difference between them and the two cartoony counterparts. The 2015 team took on Doom alone out of arrogance. It was by choice. Whereas the 2005 team were separated. They just coincidentally took him on one by one whenever they saw him because of the script, I guess. Yeah, I have no explanation for that. Just a plethora of convenient plot holes. But once they were united, they almost immediately took him down. And Reed used less than 10 words to explain how to beat him. This Reed presumably took an essay as they literally huddled around like football players so that he could explain the game plan. Don't even get me started with this idiot taking a nap and letting them talk amongst themselves. Seriously, why didn't he just do what he did to that one dude in the lab to every single one of them? Anyways, teamwork goes to the original Fantastic Four. Yeah, I said original. I'm not counting that abomination. Here is the final scoreboard with the end results. This may or may not be controversial, but despite how Johnny plays too much and how butthurt Sue gets, the 2005-2007 Fantastic Four team have the brawn and speed to come out on top. 
And though the team doesn't have the smarter genius on their side, they've got the teamwork experience, and they've got to know each other's strengths and weaknesses really well. The 2015 team does have a powerful set of abilities at their disposal, but they barely even know each other, and that's their biggest downfall. Like seriously, I think Johnny only said one thing to Ben throughout the entire runtime, and it was an insult. And that's not cool, you barely even know the dude. They're not that close yet. That's just being rude. So harnessing the power may lead to some conflict. The rebooted team was just not enough to beat the cliche numbnuts from a decade ago. The winner is the 2005 Fantastic Four. Man, I love this job. Who do you think should be in the next versus video? Let me know down in the comment section below. Just to clarify again, as I'm still getting comments like do Batman vs Green Arrow or Wolverine vs Cyborg, I only do mirror matchups, like Spider-Man v Spider-Man or Deadpool v Deadpool. Anyways, thanks for watching guys. If you like this video then be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Also, consider following my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. And for more of my videos, just click right here.